and we're going to look at some some uh, major points, giving us an image of what is actually taking place. Chapter 1 begins uh, as so. And after this, I saw four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So we got vegetation. We have the earth itself. The uh, winds of the four directions, and each messenger or angel is assigned a direction or location north, east, west, and south. Now that's the news, because they're actually bringing forth a very special news. Their assignment is to hold the winds for a very special purpose. And let's look at that purpose, which is where we're starting. And I saw another messenger coming up and rising from, and this is verse 2, from the rising of the sun, holding the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four messengers to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea. So this other messenger, he cried out to the other four messengers. So a messenger is bringing a message to the other messengers who are in the four corners saying, do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim upon their forehead. Now, let's, let's establish this, that with Revelation, this is the revelation of Yochanan, or John, who is writing and was translated or transformed by the Spirit and he, he looks into heaven and he's called. So by spirit, he was translated into heaven to bear witness. Why? So that word can be related in the earth. What is soon to take place in heaven that is taking place now and soon will be taking place in the earth. So just what is happening is this. Let's go to verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And of the tribe of Yehuda, or tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed of the tribe of Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Simeon, Levi, Zebulon, Benjamin, Issachar, Manasseh. So in other words, out of all the nations of the earth, this is being proclaimed in heaven. First, he says, he seals all of the tribes that are in the earth. Those who we must call. Who is it? These are the called out ones of the house of Judah. See, we, we've been under a, a teaching that says... Um, when the master comes back, that he will take his 
I'll say it like this. He will take his church and leave the Jews to uh, suffer the uh, rapture or the church will be raptured out and the Jews will be left. Well, according to Revelation that, that is to be fulfilled, they're the first ones called in this list. It says, of the tribe of Yehuda, 12,000 were sealed. So, I say that to say this, that from every tribe of the house of Jacob, according to this chapter 7, they are sealed. And who is this um, strong messenger? After looking at it, I would say this is Michael. Because Michael has a job of war. He fights against the enemy for the house of Israel. And here, he is saying to the four messengers that are stationed on the four corners of the earth, do not let the winds prevail. So they are holding back trauma. Everything that's going to happen to the earth until these 144,000 are sealed. They're the ones who are being sealed. Now, can we say that we are one of the 144,000? I don't know. Because they will be named. The time they will be named will be when he returns and the name is inscribed on their forehead. That is the only time we can say exactly who is who. And who they are are the bloodlines to those who are the mixed multitude. But these 144,000 are the individuals who would be named as the leaders of those families. They will be given a rock in their hand, according to chapter 2. And not only, according to chapter 2, I think, without going back and looking at that just now, I think that's going to be the multitude who will be given a rock. But these would be named in their forehead for Yahweh, and Yeshua. Those two names and the city I know is is um, is defined by them or they will be defined by those three names. The land, the city, Yahweh, Yeshua. And the rock I believe would tell each of us of what tribe and what gate we go through. As we continue to go through this, that will unfold. So right now, where we are, chapter 7 identifies the 12 tribes. What else? Let's look at verse 14. And I said to him, Master, you know. Let me go to 13. And the one of the elders responded, saying to me, Who are these dressed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And he said to me, These are they, those coming out of great distress, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, this is going to help when we go back. I want you to tie this in when I start speaking of the 24 elders. Who are they? The ones out of great distress. Their robes was washed in the blood of the Lamb. Could this happen before that? No. The Lamb had to be slain in order to get what was inside of him, the blood, which was the cleanser of the robes. Because before that, their robes were stained with guilt. 
and the blood has to wash them white. That's the reason that they are white. It's because the red blood washes all impurities. And this is why we see them in white robes. So it's 24 elders. Who are these elders? You got 12 on one side, 12 on the other. And just hold it to the end. All right, let's go to, well, let me finish that. Because of this, and I'm verse 15, because of this, they are before the throne of Elohim and serve him day and night in his dwelling place. This is the temple that's not made by hand. This is the temple that, that's made in heaven by Yahweh. But this is the reason why when we read through the making of the temple, why it was so um, meticulous, so much detail in everything we saw, 50, 50 hooks in, in the, the um, wires that go down to the ground and hold down the tent itself. These all have special, significant information. And just quickly on that one, the hook also represents the vowel, the sixth letter of the Hebrew left back. The hook also represents the nail that went into the hand of God as man. Fifty also represents jubilee when he will come back yes. and the captives shall be set free. Hallelujah. And we have a nerve not to be celebrating it. Wait a minute. If you believe that he's coming back to set us free, Shouldn't you celebrate before it happened because simply he said to do it? Well, yes. when do we celebrate Jubilee? Well, look at Leviticus chapter 23. It gives you all of the seven holy days. And this one is the 50 day. So you have Passover, unleavened bread, feast of weeks, which is also first fruits because at the beginning it's first fruits. At the end, what do we do? We celebrate Shavuot. Pentecost, 50 days. So, should we not celebrate the Messiah coming back to redeem us ahead of time, believing that he's good for it? See, all of these things, they work together. Uh -huh. Beginning with Passover, and they all connect. So, look how it connects to even the temple. So, but that's not where we're at today. But I just want you to see some of the symbolism. Everything about the, every detail about the, the, the temple. This is why he told Moshe, be careful that you do everything according to what I have shown you right. in the clinic. Mm -hmm. Everything about the temple. And now that the physical temple has been torn and demolished because of sin each time, first one and second one, it was destroyed by fire. Now the temple is here. Our bodies is a living temple of Elohim. That's what Shaul tells us. Know ye not that your body are the living temple of the Elohim. So what was good for the temple is also good for the temple. So what was not good for the temple, in the temple, we must know that it should be good. And I'm just going to come right out and say it. He did not allow unclean meats to be offered up in the temple. And this is what the enemy did. When they took over Jerusalem and desecrated the temple, they put up a statue of Zeus and offered up a pig on the altar. Now, if our bodies are the living temples of God, he tells us not to build false idols. 
And he tells us to do not eat unclean meat. And we do both. That's not where we're at today, so I'm going to keep moving. So, this temple that was created in heaven was made by Yahweh. And that which is in the earth is a copy of it. Verse 16 says, They shall hunger no more, neither uh, thirst any more, neither shall the sun strike them, nor any heat. Because the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them and lead them to the fountains of water of life. And Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now we're talking about what is going to happen in the earth that has already happened in heaven. And we have some who have overcome the earth to get there and say, hey, we were there in the earth and now we see that we are here and they are worshiping and bowing in praise to Yahweh. Let's go to chapter 4. That's chapter 7. And now, chapter 4 says this. Someone read verse 1, please. Um, read it through verse 5. Just keep going straight through verse 5. Make it 7, verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. seven. After this, I looked and saw a door having been opened in the heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I shall show you what has to take place after this. And immediately I came to be in the spirit, saw a throne set in the heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a ruby stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an em emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting dressed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And out of the throne came lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of Elohim. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like a crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion, and the second living creature like a calf. And the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Very interesting. These four creatures all have very significance in what we're looking at. Just know that this is part one of the crucifixion after. Had it not been for the crucifixion, this part would not be here. So this is part one, because it can only happen after the lamb has been slain. So this is immediate after Yeshua. These four creatures have also four wings. We see one, a lion, two, a calf. Three, a man's face. And four, eagle. All with six wings. Mm -hmm. The eagle will come into play shortly. Um, in, I think chapter 8 we'll see more of a definition of the eagle. And I'll tell you that the eagle is what speaks after the third woe. You have... Um, three woes. Let me go there. You have three woes. After the fourth trumpet, I'm sorry, 
there's an eagle that flies in the heaven, which is chapter 8, verse 13, it says, And I looked and I heard an eagle in the midst of heaven crying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those dwelling upon the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three messengers who are about to sound. Now I like what Rabbi too said uh, about the woe before. He said, woe, a uh, watch out. Everybody. Everybody <laughs> in the earth. Basically, that's Everybody. really what it is. Watch out. Everybody on earth. Because the last three are the worst. So the first four of the trumpets, we will know, especially when that third one get here, you won't make no mistake about that one. And the fourth one is even more devastating. But when the fifth one comes, you really don't want to be in his company. Because actually, that one, as I told you before, is Lucifer. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. But we just, we'll, we'll see each of them, each of the trumpets, as we go. Now, this first one in chapter, at chapter 4 says, After this I saw, I, I looked and saw a door. What does the scripture say about no man comes before the Father except by me. So he is, Yeshua is the door whereby man gets to the Father. So, the 24 elders could not get to the Father without him as the door. And his part wasn't completed until his death. No man. They were here, the 24 elders. Elders basically mean the older. These, in this instance, they are the, the fathers of the tribes. And each in part. Now, and I'll, I'll uh, explain how it gets to be 24. Because actually, you have the 12 tribes who came out of Egypt. But then you also have the disciples that was with Yeshua. All right? And I'll explain a little more about that in just a moment. So, no man comes unto the Father except by me. Uh, and all those good scriptures that follow that, he is the door. Um, and then, he also blows the trumpet. He's one of the messengers with the trumpet. So actually, I'll go ahead and tell you that one too. He is the seventh. He is the seventh of those messengers. I told you, the last three are the worst. The fifth one is the deceiver. He comes before Messiah to deceive that he is the Messiah. But he comes too early and he deceives. All right. I shall show you what has to take place after this. So in other words, he's given him a chronological um, look in what is going to take place in heaven and in earth. So he came to be in the spirit. So he was translated. The one that sat on the throne, verse 2, um, he tells us how he looked like jasper, ruby stone appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like emerald in appearance. So right here, there's someone on the throne, and it's not naming who's on the throne. But it tells us there's a rainbow. The rainbow is a what? A sign. Where does it go? Back to Noah. So there's something about Noah that we need to keep in mind here, that it stretches all the way to the time Messiah comes. And around the throne is also 24 elders dressed in white robes. And what else did they have? They had golden crowns on their head. And seven lamps 
were before the throne, and which were the seven spirits. Mm -hmm. Let me read it. And out of the throne came lightnings of fire, and burnings before the throne, which are the seven spirits of Elohim. So these seven spirits, as we spent a lot of time on, and I tell you, it is still very difficult to really just say, this Definitely. is a definite. But all we can do is, is, is continue to, to reach for it because there is a mystery to it, as the scripture says. But we also know that these seven spirits are in the hand of who? Yeshua. They're also in his right hand. And what does the right hand uh, represent? Power and authority. So these seven spirits, something about these seven spirits are receiving power and authority from the one that holds them. Why does he hold them? Because he's the master. Now, as I was describing the four creatures, we have the lion. There's a significant aspect to the lion. He is the king of the jungle. He rules. He has all weapons of destruction to make sure that he eats. But also, in this lion, I see the second coming of the master or the high, uh, uh, the, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest of the tribe of Judah. He comes back as the Lion of Judah. This calf, this calf also represents something that is awaiting, and that is that there's going to be a red heifer born into the earth which is also a sign of his return, a sign of the elders that will be in the earth to be cleansed once again. In the face, the third one was like the face of a lion, a uh, man. Messiah, basically, he comes back as man to receive man to himself once again. So these four creatures, it says, and they were living and giving the same and respect and thanks to him who was sitting on the throne, who lives forever and ever. Now, this forever and ever, the animals that was also there was also giving thanks and respect. The animals were never to be slaughtered for food, but because of sin, they too suffer. And do you think that maybe that because they are also waiting for the sons and daughters of this generation to be identified and to finally get into the land where the first fruit of peace will happen? Why? Because in the land, it will be the first recipient of no longer killing animals for food. So can you put yourself in the animal's place where they feel that every animal that's bigger than them get to eat them, simply because they may be bigger and stronger. And those are the ones who are carnivores. But I can imagine them waiting, but seeing it here, and seeing that they are also applauding, and all of heaven breaks out with praise, and seeing the animals here also worshiping the Father, makes me feel that maybe they too are waiting for this to happen, because the first part, he shows up as one of them, a lamb. He didn't show up as a man slain. He showed up as an animal. The animal kingdom. And not the great king. Because
because he's unclean. He died as an humble lamb. The character of which we must become. But he said, if you suffer with me, you'll also reign with me. Now, can you understand why the brothers who walked with Yeshua when he was here, why they had to die in such manner? They could have put together great armies and fought their oppressors. But they just went around and taught and taught. And they too earned, he said, if you suffer with me, you'll also reign with me. So now we are starting to see them in heaven, 24 elders, the 12 tribes, and also the 12 apostles. And I think that's in chapter 18. When we get there, we'll see it a little clearer. All right, so now chapter 4. Well, let me read that verse 10. Verse 10 says, The 24 elders fall down before the, uh, him and sit before him who sits on the throne and bows before him who, who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Yahweh, to receive esteem and respect and power. For you have created all, and because of your desire, they are and were <coughs> created. Chapter 5. Now, there's something very special here. And I'm going to ask my wife if she'll collect her thoughts on this and share something she, she picked up on a couple of weeks back. Um, that's so awesome right here in chapter 5. But I want to read down through it and then um, so that we'll have a, a perspective on what we're looking at. Um, Cece, will you read for us? Can you see it okay up here? Go ahead and read down through 7, verse 7. Verse 8. From, from what? Chapter Five, verse one through verse eight. Chapter five, verse one through eight. Mm -hmm. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, having been sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong messenger proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen its seals? And no one in the heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. And I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the line of the tribe of Yehuda, the root of David, overcame to open the scroll and to loosen its seven seals. And I looked and saw in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders a lamb standing as having been slain, <laughs> having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls filled with incense which are the prayers of the set of hard ones. Mm. All right, so to kind of look at this, what we have is in the right hand of the one that sat on the throne, a scroll. There's something very significant about this scroll. Perhaps we're going to bring that in in just a moment. It was sealed by how many seals? Seven, Seven seals. And a strong messenger was proclaiming who is worthy to open the seals. And he spoke this in the, in the, in the company of the 24 elders, the four creatures, 
Now, the reason there's a light cast on the 24 elders because they are also represented by the one, uh, one of the creatures who had the face of man. But it shined on them because there was a greater weight placed on man as men who needed a redeemer to be redeemed back to a rightful place. Remember, a woman asked Messiah when he was here, said, my sons, the sons of Zebedee, permit one to sit on your right hand and another to sit on your left hand side. This is very significant here. What was his answer? Can they eat, drink from the cup I'm about to drink from? You mean permit. You said permit. I'm sorry, permit. Can they drink from the cup that I'm about to drink from? And they thought they could. So I searched a little later when he was in, in the uh, garden. They were there. By name, they were there. And something so profound came out of this that he says, well, I cannot give you the seats that are on either side of me because my father has already given that. So what we see are the 24 elders. They were the ones who were given that, those seats. And who they represent are the 12 tribes. So it makes sense to me that those of us who do and keep the commands of God, he has preserved seats for us. And the elders who have gone on ahead of us are already there. They're not dead waiting for judgment to happen. They're already there. We see them, 24 elders, sitting on his side, his right and his left. So, with that said, they said, who is able to open the seal? No one in heaven, no one in earth, or even under the earth. One of the four creatures uh, something that was left out of the four creatures were the fish, those who were under the earth. I wondered why they were named specifically. But actually, their presence is being spoken of in verse 3 of heaven. So why not anyone in heaven? Because according to the law, there has to be, and we only see this, in marriage. And this is why Yahweh has set his Torah that we may follow it so that we will understand better by and by. When there is a divorce, a husband cannot take back his bride that was divorced. He said it would be as a dog going back to its vomit. Once there is a divorce, it's now, it's dissolved, it's too late. You cannot, according to his law. I mean, you can say, well, a lot of people have done it, and you know, it's worked, and they stayed married. His law said you cannot. Just because he says you can't do something don't mean that we don't do it. He tells us not to sin. We still sin. So let's just understand, he gives us direction for a very good reason. We may not understand it right now, but later we will. All right, so we have this, this, this husband who cannot take his bride back because he has divorced and taken another bride. However, there is an opening. There must be a death. And only Yeshua can fulfill that because we as mortal men cannot die and come back to take our wife. So therefore, Israel 
Ephraim was divorced from Yahweh. But he came as man and died so that he can retrieve his bride. That's the window he left that only he can enter. So, we have the line, verse 5 says, do not weep. Well, John, he begins to weep. Let me go ahead and look at that. Verse 4 says, I wept much. Chapter 5, verse 5 says, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of, of David, overcame to take the scroll and loosen its seven seals. I looked, John, I looked and saw in the midst of the throne, the four creatures and the elders, a lamb standing and having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim, sent into all the earth. And he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. Let's look into this lamb. Who was this lamb? Rabbis, if you're ready, there's something very significant about the scroll that was in his hand that caused Yohanan to start just weeping. He was crying uncontrollable. Why? Because there was no one in heaven who was in heaven? God, first of all, let's say God himself was in heaven. But he says no one in heaven could open it. And then let's go to the lesser. Let's say, what about all the other messengers that were there? What about the 24 elders that were there? What about the four creatures that were there? He said no one in heaven was worthy to open it worthy to open it. Then he said, hey, let's look at the earth. Nobody in the earth, forget that. <laughs> nobody, nobody in earth can even open that. And I'm going to try to get to something else. I'm going to try to start closing this out to, to show you. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, rather stand. Okay. Um, as I was looking through this, studying uh, through this uh, portion of Revelation, I looked at the scroll and wondered why it spoke of it as a, um, let me go back to the first. It called it a book that was written on both sides. And then in the scripture it said, uh, a scroll that was open on both, that was written on both sides. And uh, so as I went to search out that scroll, I found it, found it also to mean a letter of divorcement. And it specifically said in the, uh, the, uh, as relation to what he was holding in his hand that it was a letter of divorcement. And so as I went on down and read, then I kept looking at the word open, and it did say from literal being open, but the, the, the um, I guess, I, I guess you could say actual, uh, uh, what it was using it more as, was towards the fact of eradicating that so that word scroll going from using just the word scroll uh, when it says the scroll was in his hand in number one he who sat on the throne the scroll uh, letter of divorcement was in his hand and then open that word open meaning eradicate and uh, that's why John was weeping. So um, I believe it was the Holy Spirit, because I just don't think about things like that. Uh, took out 
the words that was actually there and by no mean or stretch of the word am I trying to change the scripture or anything like that but trying to take the words as they broke them down in Greek from the Hebrew I tried to take them back to these people being Hebrew uh, uh, people or John being Hebrew and being raised in a Hebrew culture that he would have been looking at from the sight of his own culture and his language. So I read it from that standpoint and it says who was um, that and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a letter of divorcement having been sealed with seven seals and then the messenger, strong messenger stands up and he says, who is worthy to eradicate this divorce, this letter of divorcement and to loosen its seals. And then it goes on and it says, he was weeping. This is why John was weeping so, because it wasn't just to the point of us just to open it. Because why would it be so difficult to just open it? It wasn't just about opening it. It was about eradicating it. It was about making things right and being able to know, make a know the divorce decree that had been pronounced on the house of Israel. And so as that's why John was weeping and crying so, because Israel had been divorced. So he's standing there and then the, the messenger, one of the elders says, don't weep, don't weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, overcame to eradicate the divorcement and loosen its seals. And so that's why all of the heavens broke out in a thunderous worship because he could eradicate the divorce decree. I am so excited about this because we get to look back at this with the hindsight of 2020. And let me just borrow your imagination for a quick second. And this is all JB 101. A strong messenger, one of the 24 elders, can we say that possibly that could have been Kepha? Because he recognized him. And this is why he was telling Yochanan, don't cry. But that's not set in stone. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm guessing. So if I'm allowed to guess, just give me one. Just let me guess at that. That it could possibly be because with, with Yeshua, he had a very strong role. Yes. And this identifies one as strong. And having been here in the earth and walking with him and teaching and believing in him, who's now sitting on the sides, the right and left hand side, would recognize the lamb because he was there and knew when the lamb was slain. He understood the whole system because they lived it. So, that's just my hypothetical. Now, back to what the scripture says. It says that they all broke out with a shout. Well, the lamb, he had seven horns, seven eyes, the seven spirits of all he. He was able to take the scroll from the hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. And the one who was sitting on the throne had a rainbow around him. And also that one that sit on the throne, which would be Yahweh, said something about Noah. So this is why we have to, we have to keep Noah in the picture. He said he was perfect in his generation. So we're going to look at something in just a few moments 
Uh, looking at that, and I want to close off with, with Hebrews chapter 7. But first, I want to, I want to scan through uh, chapter 6 so we don't have to go back there. That's part 1. Part uh, chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation is part 1. And this is the, the now seeing after the crucifixion, we see the four creatures and the 24 elders. Now. It couldn't happen before the lamb showed up, or before the lamb was slain, I'm sorry. It couldn't happen before that. So in order for them to even take part in heaven, to be loosed from their chains of death, the lamb had to be slain. Because no man comes to the Father. He is what? The diet? He is the door by which Man, those who were crucified and died for his sake, he said, you shall find it again. Now we see them in the heavens. Now let's look at chapter uh, 6 real quick, and I'll be a couple of minutes on this. And then we're going to go to uh, Hebrews in chapter 7, where I'm going to close out, just to tie everything together. Because I want to show you what this and who this is in heaven. And I know that we know Chapter 6 is now our, our second part, which we see the conquering king. Um, Rabbi, can you read, read chapter, verse 1, please? Just 1? Yes, verse 1 will do. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, like a sound of thunder, come and see. All right, so what did he come to see? Four horses, verse 2, the white horse, verse 3, the red horse, verse 5, the black horse, verse 8, the pale horse. What do these horses represent? Now, we have the conquering king who's riding the first horse because it says, um, verse 2 says, and I looked and I saw a white horse who's he who sat on it holding a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out overcoming and to overcome. So there's something about a conquering king here because there's a crown and he's also given a bow. What do you use a bow for? It's a weapon of war. Also a hunter. But don't forget that Yeshua, or the Lamb, has, what, seven different spirits? And we try to, you know, just limit him to one. He can either be man, or he can be God. But, see, he comes in different forms, or different spirits that we can see. So, we have the conquering king on the white horse, and the red horse, um, this one, is a dragon. It's the dragon, we'll see him a little later on in this, uh, when the um, three woes, or the three last woes, where the eagle begins to say, woe, woe, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. This one is the one who receives the commands, and this is actually a spirit of Hasatan. Devil, evil, uh, devil, um, dragon and something else. He's called by different names and this is one of his spirits that will be invoked. The third seal, which is the black seal, is I see a bit of famine and, and some other um, other stuff here as well, but yeah, it, it's, it's got the scales here. Um, Justice and in, in injustice and righteousness and unrighteousness here. Unfair scales. Unfair scales. Then the fourth, the fourth seal, the fourth, um, fourth horse, uh, the pale horse, is death and the grave. Verse 12 says, and I looked when I, when he opened the sixth seal, I saw a great earthquake. 
came to be, and the sun became black and sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, and a fig tree dropped uh, to unripened figs beyond uh, being shaken by a strong wind. Also, this connects us back to Yeshua cursing the fig tree. Remember? So all these things are very significant for a greater understanding as we go through. And I, I'm not going to go through that right now because I need to leave this part right here. Um, we see uh, the seven spirits spoke about in the book of Revelation about seven different times. And it's trying to get a message over to us about the spirits of Yeshua. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 7, and I'm going to close out with that and try to be brief, so I may probably cut down on what I will present from this portion. Okay, chapter 7. Why is this very significant? Well, let me go ahead and read that. It'll probably come out a little faster. Um... Rabbis, will you read through verse 3, please? For this Melchizedek, sovereign of Shalom, priest of the Most High Elohim, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the sovereigns and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, his name being translated indeed first, sovereign of righteousness, and then also sovereign of Shalom. <coughs> that is sovereign of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but having been made like the son of Elohim, remains a priest for all time. So we have both here that are being introduced, Melchizedek, and we have Yeshua, the son like the son of Elohim. There's a relation here relationship here that needs to be explained. Because here, we, we make the mistake of believing that Melchizedek has no beginning, no end. And what it's simply doing is tying something in for us here about another priesthood that had not been spoken of. And uh, we'll look at that in just a second, but I just want to explain here that Abraham gives a tithe to Melchizedek, meaning that the lesser give the tithe to the greater, whereas Abraham, we know that he was born in the year uh, 1948, coming from creation. Him paying a tithe to Melchizedek is saying that this is my elder, he is my senior. Okay, let me leave it there for, for a moment. All right, now, let me move, uh, move on. Um, here it is, verse 4. It says, Now see how great this one was, to whom even the ancestor Abraham gave a tenth of the choice booty, meaning that which he had abstracted from his retaking Lot and all that was with him. Now, this word ancestor, what does that denote? In verse 4, ancestor Abraham. Someone of his lineage. That means it's someone of his lineage. Right. So Abraham, to be in order to be his ancestor, that means there's a family bloodline. So that helps us understand that it's not really talking about that he has no beginning and no end. But it is confused that way because of the way it's spoken. But this, because it comes behind something I'll explain in just a moment, um, the word change makes this look like Abraham, uh, Melchizedek has no beginning and no end. Well, to really look at this, going beyond Abraham, there's something that happened to the earth. 
and we all know it to be as a flood. 1656, the flood happened. And that's only just about, it's just on the 300 years difference between from the time that Abraham was born to the flood. Now, we know who was there during the flood was Noah and his three sons. Now, but the word of the oath or the promise which came after the Torah appoints, after Mount Sinai, appoints the sons having been perfected forever. Isn't this what Yahweh said about Noah? That he was what? Perfect? in his generation. So it makes sense that he would have a son who all the world thinks that he has no beginning and no end because of the flood wiping out all information and only knowing him by the name of King of Peace. Also King of Righteousness. And to sum it up, verse uh, chapter 8 Verse 1 and 2, we are summing up. Now, the summary of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, Yeshua, who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the greatness in heaven. Don't forget about the 24. And who carves, who serves in the center part place of the true tent. What true tent? The one that was made in heaven. So that Moses, when he was shown, be sure to make it as you see the one in heaven. Which Yahweh set up and not man. Who set the one up in, in earth? Man. So this is talking about a tent that's in heaven and not in earth. And who becomes the high priest? Yeshua. And he has to also, this is part two, return to offer up gifts. And that's, that's what it goes on in, well, let me read it. Verse 3. For every priest, high priest, is, anoint, is appointed to offer both gifts and slaughters. So, it, is, it was necessary, also necessary, for this one, one who, Yeshua, to have somewhat to offer. For if indeed he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Six, there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serves a copy and shadow of the heavenly, as Moshe was warned when he was, when, when he was about to make the tent. For he said, see that you will make all according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, I know that that still takes some absorbing and really putting it all together, but it was necessary for me to take a little extra time to, to show you in sequential order how that works. Yeshua, he was sacrificed. He was the lamb. He shows up in heaven. As they are crying, there's no one to open the seven seals who's worthy because he was slain, he was killed as a sacrificial animal. Even the animals are there and giving praise and worship and, and the 24 elders are bowing down and all of heaven is excited because the one that shows up is a lamb and he looks as though he had been slain. And he takes the scroll from the one sitting on the throne. And he is now able to open it. Why? Because he died. And he also becomes a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Eternal. Whereas man, they keep dying. Every time you name a high priest, he has to give up offering for himself, his own sin. And for those who were sinful, but they died. This one, he becomes high priest of the greater 
tabernacle, which is in heaven. So now, part two, he gets to do, because part one has been completed. Part two, he comes back to get the 12 tribes that have been multiplied. From 12 to 144,000, he will bless them, and they will help him in all the nations so that he received his inheritance. And this is the gift that he will give to Yahweh, the nations of the earth. Can we give Father praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I really need to push through that because it, 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 it takes a lot to really understand that. If you just do it in bits and pieces, you'll forget and it's hard to see. So, are there any questions anyone have on that part or any portion of what we went through? Let's go on to the next part. And, and at any point, you know, now, later on, you know, after, it doesn't matter. I'm always willing to, to uh, answer questions. Um, this, yes? I just have one.